So my naam is Pepijn Overbeke. Um, I am here to tell you about zero knowledge proofs for income statements. It is based on a proof of concept we did earlier and also uh, we participated in a hackathon in June, uh, which we won by the way. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about it, um, uh, what we did, etc, etc. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, first an overview of the problem and the solution, what we tried to tackle and how we did it. And then also a bit of a component overview and I hope to get to the explanation of the zero knowledge proof. So, but first uh, a bit about me. Uh, well, my name is Pepijn Overbeek, as I already mentioned. I uh, graduated in mathematics uh, and I've been working for two years now at Deloitte as a blockchain developer. But due to my mathematics skills, I also have a strong affinity for zero knowledge proofs. Um, I like everything related to mathematics. Haskell is my favorite programming languages and I like dark modes even on my presentations. So, uh, a little bit of history. So about a year and a half ago, we at Deloitte, at the uh, real estate department, we were trying to uh, look into zero knowledge proofs. We had uh, read a lot in the news, for example, uh, EY did something with zero knowledge proofs, also ING, so we also wanted to uh, jump the hype train, so to say. So we started looking in where can we apply zero knowledge proofs in the real estate sector. So one of the first things that came to mind was income statements. This is, you can think about giving your income statement for a, a mortgage you want from the bank, or in the case of a rental apartment, you sometimes also have to provide your income statement. So we created a, a proof of concept based on a zero knowledge proof for an income statement. And we talked to several companies about, hey, look at this proof of concept we made. Can we maybe uh, do some demo with you? and also with the, the Dutch government. And eventually the Dutch government was like, hey, we're organizing this hackathon. Maybe it might, might be nice for you guys to join us. So we joined team with uh, Rabobank, who provided an identity app, uh, and we joined the hackathon together. So let me first explain you the current process with uh, providing the rental income in case of a uh, rented apartment. So who here has done this sometime in their lifetime that they had to provide their rental income in order to get a house? So that's a lot of people. Um, I did it also like a half a year ago and I had to provide a lot of documents. Like I had to provide my last three uh, rent rolls or no, my income statements from uh, the company. I had to provide a copy of my ID. Uh, and some other documents which say that I was a Dutch citizen, for example, or that I actually have a residence permit. So all these documents, they are provided in a PDF or a Word document, and they're very prone to be erroneous because people can just change their own documents or their Word documents. They can change their income. And the housing corporation, in this case, they have to check all these documents for validity which is a very time-consuming process and also you can make errors during this process. And me as a user, I do not have to do this once for... Uh, sorry, I do not have to do this one time, no, I have to do this like multiple times. For each housing corporation, I have to do this whole process again and again and again. The main problems in this current setup is, of course, the privacy issues, because now I have to provide a lot of this extra information, which they don't need. I need to provide a, a valid copy of my valid ID. And they actually say at the housing corporation, like, um, mark this on your ID and add this text so no one can use it anymore if they steal it. And this data, it must be present for auditors, like a long time after I potentially got the apartment. And it's also very time consuming because you actually need people manual processes to verify all this data, which takes a lot of time and, of course, is very prone to errors. So why use a zero knowledge proof in this case? Well, first of all, no user data in our solution will be shared. So the privacy of the user is still maintained. Uh, it can be automatically verified by machines, although that is not uh, inherent to the zero knowledge proof, but more to automation in general, but it's nice to then add some more privacy to it. And we can use the data directly from the source. 
we extract the data from, let's say, tax authorities, we provide that it's legal, or we, sorry, we provide the signature by the tax authorities, and in that way, other people can immediately verify that the source was indeed a valid source. So with this idea in mind, we participated at the hackathon. The hackathon was uh, organized by Regie op Gegevens, which loosely translates to, uh, well, manage your own data, uh, which is part of the Dutch government. And uh, they focused on four, four key elements, data minimalization, applicability, people focused and inclusive. Well, we already thought we had the first three components. So during the hackathon, we mainly focused on inclusiveness, but it was enough for us to actually win the hackathon, which we're very proud of. So, as I said, we partnered up with uh, Rabobank during the hackathon. Uh, and we also partnered up with Allian, the Alliancy, which is a Dutch housing corporation, which during the next steps will provide us with the actual uh, apartment renters uh, for our proof of concept. So, how does our solution work? Well, the first thing that will happen is that the user or the, the people who search the apartment, they will get uh, a committed value of their income from the, from the government, in this case. The government signs this committed value, so it can be then transferred to other people who can then verify it. This user can then create zero knowledge proof based on this commitment value and can send it to the housing corporations. And the housing corporations can then validate the zero knowledge proof and immediately see if the income is valid or not and then grant the house based on the zero knowledge proof. So what are the implications for different parties if we're actually going to use such a solution? Well, first of all, you have the government and the government needs to provide an API which can create committed values of people's rental income. At the moment, unfortunately, they do not have such an API, so that is something they have to create. And unfortunately, they are a bit unwilling to do it because governments are very slow most of the time. Um, and second, the user. For the user, this has a lot of implications because if you can recall in your memory all the documents you have to provide for getting an apartment, it's so much. But just imagine that instead of providing all these documents, you just scan a QR code, as you saw in the, in the movie at the beginning, and then it's all done. It's so much easier for users to actually do it. And also, if you look at people in society who struggle with a lot of these documents, for them it's also a much easier process, which is a win for everybody. And of course, the housing corporations, they don't have to verify all this data manually anymore. They can just very easily, automatically, verify that the rental incomes are correct. So it saves them a lot of time and a lot of costs. So if we're looking at a component overview. So in the center, you see the My ID. This is the, the app created by Rabobank. It's an identity wallet. And you sign in to this app via uh, EDIN, which is a way to authenticate yourself via your bank. Now, this My ID app, you can get your income statements from the government. So you log in with uh, DigiDay, Digi and the government then provides your income statements to the app. And the app can then create zero knowledge proofs and send them to the housing corporations based on the question that the housing corporations ask. So there's also a, a blockchain component underneath, right, right, oh, sorry, right here. And the government can uh, issue on the blockchain that they have given uh, a civilian a certain rental income, and then they can revoke it later on. For example, if it's not valid, or if this person was a criminal and they want to retract the income statement. The housing corporations can validate this data on the blockchain, can see if the rental income is uh, revoked or not, and based on that, again, grant validity of, grant the validity of the zero knowledge proof. So the My ID app was, or is a uh, identity wallet created by Rabobank. You have a question? Yeah, yeah you talk about zero knowledge proof, but what is the statement that you prove? 
I will get to that. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, so the identity wallet uh, from the Rabobank. Uh, and it's a wallet where you can have all your personal information stored and you can then use this wallet to provide your information to third parties by sharing it to them. Uh, it also makes use of Ethereum blockchain, which it stores it uh, at the stations on so other companies can validate the information in the wallet. We extended this wallet with our zero knowledge proof as proof of concept um, and in that way enriched uh, the wallet with the capability to do zero knowledge proofs on incomes. So, what is the zero knowledge proof we used? So, we used range proofs in order to uh, prove that your income is within a certain range. For example, for social housings, you usually have a maximum on the amount of money you have to earn each year. Otherwise, you cannot apply for social housing. So you can imagine that if I want to apply for social housing, my income must be between either zero euros or 40,000. So the range proof we use is the one from Budo, which is from 2000. Uh, it's a bit old, but um, we use this because it was the one we uh, first encountered a lot of times in other references by other papers. And although we have been looking into uh, other proofs, uh, we're also working together with the Universiteit Eindhoven on this. We, well, we had the most experience, so we just use this for our proof of concept, but in the future we might be using something different. So, since I'm a mathematician, it was inevitable that there would be math in my presentation. So, if it's either too simple for people or too high over, I uh, apologize in advance. But I'm going to walk you through uh, the math of the zero knowledge proof. So, first thing we need is we need an element of our group. Remember that it's the group of multiplicative inverses. Uh, the n, the, the order of the group is uh, a large, uh, I forgot the word, uh, a ra large number composed of multiple prime factors, usually two, um, and H is an element of the group generated by G. So the commitment we use is the Fu Fujisaka Okamoto commitment, uh, which has the nice property that it is homomorphic. So we can add uh, multiple commitments together. Uh, you can use this in the future to, for example, if you have couples, a couple who wants to rent a house, you can just add their income statements in the commitment and then it will also generate a valid proof. Uh, also a note for the real math diehards that there should be a modulo n right here, but writing equations in PowerPoint is pretty hard to do, so I just omitted it. Um, we also need a proof that a certain commitment hides a square. It's in the paper, but I'm going to leave it out for here. And we need the CFT proof, which proves that a certain number x, which is in the interval 0b, is actually in this interval. Now, using this, this is what actually happens during the creation of the proof. So, uh, theta is uh, this equation right here, and I've shorted E for the commitment. So, the first thing we do is we set E tilde and E bar, which then, uh, as you divide E by G to the power A, it just becomes the commitment of x minus a and in e bar it becomes the commitment of b minus x. Um, x tilde is x minus a and x bar is b minus x. We set these equations right here and note that th this means that x tilde is uh, x2 tilde plus x1 tilde squared and the same holds for x2 bar, oh, for x, sorry x bar. Uh, then we're going to generate some random values uh, such that uh, r tilde 1 and r tilde 1 are, are r and r bar 1, r2 bar minus r. And then we're going to compute the commitment of x1 tilde squared and x bar 1 squared, which are, as you can see, commitments which hide a square. Uh, and we're going to also calculate e tilde 2 and e bar 2. And also note that uh, e bar 2 is e bar, sorry, e tilde 2 is e tilde divided by e tilde 1. 
this is the way that the verifier computes e tilde 2 and e bar 2. So based on all this data, we can now create uh, two proofs that e tilde 1 and e bar 1 height square. And we create two CFT proofs that x tilde 2 is in this interval and x bar 2 is in the next interval. So if we've done this all correctly, then the verifier, he knows that e tilde and e bar are greater than minus theta because uh, they both height square. And since, uh, sorry, this is a mistake here. This should be e tilde 1 and e bar 1. Uh, but anyway, since e bar uh, is a committed value to x minus a and e, sorry, x e, e tilde is a committed value to x minus a and e bar is a committed value to b minus x, verifier is convinced that x is in this interval right here. If anybody has any questions about this, I can explain it in more detail, but just come please see me afterwards in lunch. Um, but as you can see, this is a uh, zero knowledge proof, which provides a range greater than the range in which x actually resides. So we now have a wider range than the possibilities of x. But in the paper, there is also uh, the extended proof, which shows how you can actually make it precise. So if we have a number x within a, uh, the interval a, b, then we can also create a proof which proves that x is in this exact interval. And you do it by just uh, setting capital T to this equation right here. Uh, x prime is 2 to the power, two to the power t my, times x and e prime is then just simply e to the power 2 to the power t. So e prime hides the commitment of x prime. Um, then you just execute the range proof proving that x prime is in this interval right here. And since uh, it can be shown that this value where t well, theta prime is this value is less than 2 to the power t, if you all calculate this, then uh, you arrive that x is in the open interval a minus 1 and b plus 1, but since, is, since x is an integer, you know that x is exact in the interval a and b. So, what are the messages that are actually sent between uh, the components in the app? So the, the, most, the two most important are, of course, between the government and the MyID app and in the MyID app and the housing corporation. So the government, if you ask your rental income, they of course send you your rental income. And they also send you the committed value of the rental income uh, together with the random value because you need it to create the zero knowledge proofs. And they provide the signature, which they signed based on their own private key, of this committed value. And they also send you the parameters needed to construct the proof. So this signature can then be transferred to someone else together with the committed value. And then this person can validate by itself that the commitment was indeed provided by the government. So if you send your rental income to the housing corporation, you include your range proof, of course, which includes the committed value. And you just provide the signature you got from the government also to the housing corporation and of course the parameters you need to, to validate the proof. So lastly there is also the blockchain uh, component as I already mentioned. Um, we did not actually implement this in the, the proof of concept during the hackathon itself because we only had a limited amount of time. Um, but the idea is that you as a government can put your uh, provided rental income on the blockchain and the housing corporation can then look if this rental income was given by the government or if it's revoked in any way. So in that case if someone's income has changed or is now below a certain threshold or above you can see if the zero knowledge proof still holds validity uh, during the time of creation. So what are the next steps? So Right now, we're looking into uh, user validation uh, of our solution. Since we won the hackathon, we are provided with a short trajectory, uh, no, sorry, it's the wrong word, a short uh, path forward to do user validation uh, with actual users. Uh, and if this goes according to plan, and if the results are positive from this user experience, 
we can continue to a demo. And already the Dutch tax, tax authorities and the Dutch uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs have already agreed to participate with us in these next steps. So that was everything I have to tell you guys. Are there any questions? A lot. <laughs> Uh, so the question was that in the proof the parameters are also sent uh, to the validator uh, and if this is necessary. So uh, no, you're correct in that uh, you can fix these values for everyone, uh, but it's just that in, in, in our implementation we just send them with because it was just a demo, but we're looking into this how we can uh, fix these values and make it more secure, but we're doing this uh, in combination with the uh, University of Eindhoven. Any other questions? Um, if I understand correctly, the, uh, the use case of the blockchain is to handle revocations. But I'm a bit puzzled because so the government issues uh, a statement on the exact income and then the app generates uh, a range proof. Yeah. So the government needs to revoke every time the income changes, whereas the, I mean, you might still be giving that valid range. So there's discrepancy between the, validi I mean, the, the validity of the, of the statement and what you do with it. So um, I'm wondering about the added value of the, uh, using blockchain for applications because there's a mismatch between those two. Uh, well, you generate your, your proof on a certain time and based on the data you got from that time from the government or if, up until it's revoked, the, your income is valid and this proof with it is still valid. And the housing corporation, of course, can store the proof with the time stamp on it, so they know that at a certain time it was valid. If it's revoked afterwards uh, and you generate a new zero knowledge proof, then your old one isn't valid anymore, but your new one is because it's a new rental income. Um, does that answer your question or not? Well, you might just go back to you might just go back to uh, the government and ask for a new statement. Yeah. But, but uh, suppose that the, the government can also revoke certain statements uh, when people don't want to. For example, if they're part of a criminal organization and it, it means that certain parts of their income were from money laundering, for example, then they want to revoke the statement, of course. So in that case, you as a citizen cannot go back to the government and ask for a new one because it's revoked. I can see the use case for revocation. It the, there were like some details that puzzled me in this case, but we can take it offline. Yeah, that's fine. Um, my question is, I didn't see how you link the identity with uh, the balance. So you commit to a range proof of some balance. Where is the identity part? So how do I know that this range proof is my range proof? So I go to someone to buy a house. Do they see my ID and then they check against my something that I provide them from the blockchain that it was me, how, how I cannot use your range proof to buy a house? Okay, so uh, the identity app, you, you authenticate via IDIN, so via your bank, so it's already in that way a, a KYC done by the bank and it's then put in your wallet. So you can just send this data together with your proof. Uh, I, I've not included it in the presentation because uh, it's, it's metadata which uh, is not part of the, the proof, but you can just add these identifiers of persons to the messages you sent, and then you can link your person to the proof. But it's still not robust in the sense that I can still prove something about my identity from the app, but uh, I should generate a proof about another commitment that is very different than the image. Sorry, can you repeat that, Daniel? Because sure. I don't think it's people in the back here. 
Yeah, I was just saying, like, wondering whether that's uh, actually robust cryptography in the sense that um, you can prove something on the metadata level or the identity app uh, level, but it doesn't tie it to the actual proof. Uh, in some sense, the balance is, has to be tied to that identity, and it doesn't seem so. Uh, I can use a different commitment or a different uh, balance that maybe not not mine. Uh, you cannot use a different commitment because then it wouldn't be signed by the government anymore. So any party receiving the commitment wouldn't accept it, right? So but if, you, if you have questions about it, we can take it offline. I'm wondering what the main, di so two things actually. One is uh, what the main difference between like the commitment scheme that you use with the range group and like a Pedersen commitment uh, that seems to be kind of the standard today in, in zero knowledge and the range group there. And uh, the other one is uh, understanding what is the revocation mechanism that you use for the government. Uh, so that seems also like a... Okay, so uh, the main reason we used, the scheme we used here was just because it was most easiest for us to implement. Uh, because we have the most experience with it, so um, if we're going to do this in a, a production environment, we're of course going to look into stuff like the years and commitments. That, that's obvious, uh, but we just haven't come to that. Uh, and as part of the revocation scheme, uh, we haven't really decided on how it looks, uh, like, like the, the technical details of it yet, uh, but we're also working on that, but you can ask me uh, in, during the lunch uh, about it more. Uh, I think uh, Gijsbert will also work on the project wants to answer this. <laughs> yeah, so my name is Gijsbert Huizer. I work together with uh, with the pine on this one. I'm from the business side. Um, so the reason that we use the government for this is that in the Netherlands you have this regulation that for applying for a social housing uh, uh, apartment, you have to base, uh, the, the social housing associations need to base their uh, uh, income check on uh, the tax statement. Um, and that's not available with the bank. So the bank knows what your income is, sort of, because they know um, uh, your, your, your balance, um, but they don't know exactly what your tax statement is. So the tax statement you need from the government, um, so that's the reason we take that one, yeah. And finally, thank you very much for time. <laughs>